Good morning, everybody. All right, today's training. Da, 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 da. Uh, it's in, intended to help ensure compliance with the permits. So it's very permit specific. Uh, based on minimum requirements in the stormwater management manual for Western Washington and the phase one and phase two permits. So that's where I got all this information from. We're not going to be talking at all about the city of Tacoma swim. Well, I may interject little things here and there, but the main training is based off of the permit and the swim WW. Um, basically, these principles can be used anywhere around the state, probably anywhere around the country, but just really important to know that every jurisdiction has their own special thing. Um, you know, in the city of Tacoma, we have lots of little things in our manual that are going to be different than, you know, the city of Seattle, King County. So if you are one of the people that's going to be doing plan review in various counties or various places around the state, remember that you always have to look at those manuals individually and consider them individually because each place has their own special needs. Okay, so why do we do these things? Well, we do them because there's regulations. Is one of the reasons why we do these sorts of, why we do plan review. Here's just the section straight out of the phase two permit. I also just referenced the phase one in case there were any phase one permittees in the room. But basically, as a phase two permittee, you have to have a program that has site plan review, inspection, and enforcement. So you have to have this program. It's in your SWIMP, it's in our permit. We have to have this program that says we review all stormwater plans for proposed development activities. So it's something we have to do for our permit, and that's why we do it. One of the reasons why we do it. Um, S5C6 also says we have to train people. Um, you have to be trained to do this work. So way to be trained, everybody. Good job. Um, so and you also have to kind of continually train yourself as a plan reviewer and train your staff. It's kind of this continual training that happens over and over again. And then I was just going to point out that there's also a whole bunch of manual report questions that are related to the program of plan review, kind of the <coughs> 45 to 55. Um, 47 is the one that specifically asks for the number of stormwater site plans that you reviewed. So you're also going to have to track the number of stormwater site plans you review as part of your permitting process. So regulations are one of the reasons why we do something. Kind of how, how, well, also regulations. So the permittees have to document the technical basis for design criteria, um, which includes how they were. So how do we do these things? Um, there's two sorts of approaches in which you can do plan review. There's the presumptive approach, which is typically what everybody follows. Uh, the presumptive approach is basically ecology's manual, the swim, for Western Washington is presumed to provide a cart. So if you're using the man, the, all the BMPs in the manual as they are in the manual, you're presumed to provide a cart, which is great. Um, but there's also an alternative for people that don't want to, or even specific projects that don't either can't use the presumptive approach or don't want to use the presumptive approach. And that's the demonstrative approach. And that's basically Someone has to prove a cart with the BMPs they're using. In the city of Tacoma, we rarely see this, but we have seen it here and there, really specific to kind of industrial sites that have a particular process that they need to do. And we usually require some sort of sampling, something like that. So just letting you know there are different approaches out there. Mostly going to be seeing the presumptive, or that's what we use in the city of Tacoma. That's what most phase one permittees use. They have their own manuals and they use the presumptive approach. Um, OK, why not regulations? Why? Well, the future depends on you, plan reviewers. Um, lots of people interact with plan sets. You know because you're an inspector. <laughs> Contractors, um, can someone look at this plan set and understand it? If they can't understand it, then we're not doing a great job. Um, one of the things we need to do is make sure that people, you know, it gets into the hands of people and they understand it. Our inspectors, your inspectors that you work with, can they understand it? Do they know what is on the plan set? Can they figure out what to even inspect? If they can't, why, why do we bother? Um, it's really bright over there, so I can't look over there. Um, asset management staff, if you guys have asset management staff, just kind of the mapping, database management, 
making sure we know where our pipes are, making sure we know where private facilities are. Uh, business inspection staff. So one, five, 10, 25, 50 years from now, will a new employee be able to figure out what is on a parcel? Because that's their, you know, someone has to inspect businesses, someone has to inspect facilities. X number of years from now, are they going to be able to figure out what that thing is that's in the ground? They should be able to based on a plan set and the associated reports. Um, transmission staff. Can the people that are actually maintaining these things, either our crews or you know your own jurisdiction crews or private contractors, can they figure out what it is so that they can maintain it? Because if we have these things in the ground and they can't be maintained, there's really no point to them. Um, property owners in the future, you know, when someone buys a new house or something, can they figure out what they have on their site? It should be able to based upon those plan sets that we approved. Um, and then complaints, drainage complaints. Presumably that's something you have in your city. It's something we have in our city. Uh, people call and say, there's a puddle in my backyard. Maybe it's because they didn't maintain their facility. Maybe they don't know they have a facility. So if there's a plan set, help you figure out what's out there. That's why we do what we do. Well, it's one of the reasons other than regulations. The more important reason in my opinion so we're going to dive right into, I think we say that there's eight steps of plan review. Let's see. OK, project history. We're going to go into each of these individually in lots of specificity. But eight steps of plan review. Project history. Where is the project? What is the project? What is it? Um, what mineral requirements apply to this project? Does the stormwater site plan address the minimum requirements? Does the plan set show the BMPs to meet those requirements? Is the design feasible? Are there means in place to access the property for inspection? So those are kind of what we consider the big steps of plan review. Project history is really important, um, and it also is very time consuming, but it's really important. So the minimum requirements or anything, you know, any requirement that applies to a project may be based upon in the history of the parcel. So is this project associated with any sort of land use action or some other sort of permit is a question that we always need to kind of the first question that should pop into our mind. Um, because land use actions or other sorts of things can vest a project maybe to an older manual, older regulations. Uh, land use actions may have or other sorts of requirements may have already defined your stormwater mitigation requirements. It may literally say, you shall install a blank at this location. Stormwater mit mitigation requirements may be different from what's in the actual stormwater management manual because of vesting or specific site conditions. So also really important to know about history because it, there may be something that's a little different than what's in the stormwater manual because of some sort of special site specific thing. Um, sometimes there's developer agreements that affect stormwater mitigation. So uh, let's think of an example. I think that the McMenamins might be an example. I'm going to pretend like it is. Um, the McMenamins building over there, which now you can't see, um, they were required to build a um, parking lot next door. They didn't end up doing it. But in theory, um, that would have been like some sort of development agreement that would have tied those two parcels together and tied all the mitigation requirements together. So there might be some sort of developer type agreement that makes you build something when you build something else and then will make a difference for your minimum requirements. Um, hearing examiner's rulings may have also very specific defined things. Um, where do we look for these sorts of things? Records, um, permit records. Hopefully you have a jurisdiction that keeps really awesome records. If you don't, then this will just take a little longer. Um, assessor records, um, so check out your assessor websites. See what's tied to various parcels. Um, 
really anywhere and everywhere? Do you have a little you know, box in the corner of someone's office? Maybe there's something in there. Uh, maybe in that stack of paper on you know, Joe's desk who left 10 years ago, maybe there's something in there. Um, so just make sure you check everywhere because project history is really important because it can actually tell you what you're required to do on a site. And also note that a parcel can have dozens of associated permits. So you might have to check with lots of associated things. It's kind of fun though, if you like research. If you're into that, it's fun. Um, step one, that's step one. So this is just a, what was I getting at here? So project history. So if you're lucky and you're high tech, you have some sort of fancy permitting program that tells you all about all your history. And it's really easy, you just type your parcel in and then all the associated parcels come up and it <coughs> tells you all about your project. That'd be great. We actually have something similar to that in the city of Tacoma. Um, but we didn't before, we were much more low tech. So this is just sort of an example of what we used to do back in the day. We used to type up a little Word document where we'd have the parcel number and then every associated parcel, you know, this one talked about, you know, at some point there was a fire alarm put in, they were re-roofing. And so it's good to have, if you have to, happen to do this sort of Word document style, a little description of what the old permits were. Because for stormwater mitigation, we don't care about an installing a water heater, so we don't need to look at that permit to figure out permit history. But the grade and fill from the Kittich field in 2007, we might care. It might be associated with the remodeling of Hoppin Hall, my building. Um, so just saying there are low tech ways you can keep track of history of a parcel. Okay, so we have this awesome program that our amazing asset management people have put together, and you guys might have something. Um, okay, I'm just going to pick some site. I'm going to pick one that I think will go to something a little exciting. Um, let's say our site is Franklin Park. So all these green things are our, in the city of Tacoma, we've got these dark green lines, those are our public pipes, and these light green lines is how we um, map our private pipes. So let's imagine we have a project right here at 1111 South 12. Let's see where our water's gonna go. We're gonna pretend it goes into this catch basin. Sometimes we have a, a trace feature that works, but it's not working right now, so we're just gonna do the fun little exercise of following where our water goes. We have arrows, which makes it nice and easy. Um, if you don't, guys don't have this, ask your jurisdiction to put a whole bunch of money into this scenario. It's great. Oh, are we going to only make it to Franklin Park? Okay, good. Doo, doo, doo. So this is something you'll have to do for every project. So you need to figure out where your water is going. But this is an example of if, if we saw something weird on this little trace world that we're going on. We would definitely need to, okay, doo, 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 I think we're doing something like this. We would definitely need to go out and, eat, well, we would either ask people that would know, like our asset management folks, what's really going on here. Or we might need to go out and, you know, pop manholes. What's going on here? Oh, that's an old pipe, so I think we went doo, 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 doo. Oh, oh, we're, we're almost there. Ah, okay, there we are. We're just at the end of the waterway here. Nice, so we made it to the Theophos, which is a saltwater body. And we didn't hit any freshwater bodies on the way. Kind of thought I was gonna pick one that would hit a freshwater body, but I didn't. Anyways, that was an example of what a plan review staff would have to, or if you're designing something too, you would be doing this too, um, would do to figure out where our water's going. Okay, so that was just that. And this is a picture of that, tra when the trace thing was working. I think we did a trace from this site and it actually um, makes this yellow line. In this, in this scenario, this purple here is a wetland. So the first thing we hit was a wetland. There's a wetland layer that we have um, that we can pull up on our system. So it hit a wetland first. This is actually, so it looks like a creek, but it's a wetland. And then it went into the um, sound. So some, some have a trace option. Trace option is also always a little squirrely, so question trace, trace options, but they're nice. 
Any questions about that scenario? If you're lucky enough to have this sort of program, if not, you're going to have to actually pull out a map and maybe a paper map. <laughs> okay, I just really want to use the one that doesn't work. Oh, okay. So on your table, we have this. There's only one of each, but this is going to be the example that we're going to be talking about when I when I have questions for you guys. I'm like, here's our example. These two go together. Here's the map. Here's the project. Right now, we're going to be talking map. Good. We're on map. So if everyone take a minute or so, peek at your map. You guys all have to share because your table table groups. Take a look at your map and think about the answer to these three questions. I'll give you guys a little bit of time. I'm not going to give you that much time. The questions aren't too hard, but if you're, if you're brand new. Um, so we want to know where is our water going? That's going to be like, a, I think the answer is like actually where it's going. Like it's going to hit blankety blank creek before it hits the blankety blank sound. Um, and then I'd like to know if that first discharge location, so that first water body it hits, is that fresh water or is it salt water? And then also the ultimate discharge location. I'm going to ask one of you. So I'm going to ask the one that looks the least comfortable. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, but I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time. Let's see if you're right. Actually, I think, I think I'm going to tell you. Hey, it goes from Pipe System to Flat Creek to Chambers Creek to Puget Sound. Good job. You guys get an A+. Plus. I'll throw candy at you if I had any. Um, and first discharge location, fresh water. So our requirements are going to be based on that fresh water system. Ultimate discharge location is salt water. Da -da -da. A+. Plus. Did everyone get that? <laughs> Step three. What is a project? This is the world of knowing definitions. You have to know so many definitions in plan review, and you have to look at them every time. I have a very tattered stormwater manual that I just flip through it a million times because you always are looking. What does that stupid word mean? And what does it mean for this project? OK. Lots of words here, but that's okay. So know your definitions, and then also, is this project exempt? We should figure that out. Do I even need to continue on the process of looking if it needs to comply with the minimum requirements of the permit? So there's a whole gamut of things that are exempt. So if the project is solely for forest practices, which maybe you're from a community that has those, we are definitely not, um, commercial egg, oil and gas field op activities and operations. Um, pavement maintenance, I'm actually going to say all of these because this one comes up a lot, at least in our urban environment. Um, pothole and square patching, overlaying existing asphalt or concrete um, without expanding that coverage area, so just a straight up overlay. Uh, shoulder grading, reshaping or regrading drainage systems, crack sealing, Resurfacing without expanding the road prism. Other sorts of pavement preservation activities that don't expand the road prism. And vegetation maintenance. Like those just alone are all exempt from the minimum requirements. Also, a big one if you're in the like, stormwater, wastewater capital world is underground utility projects. So like straight up utility projects that are replacing that surface with a similar surface are also exempt from the minimum requirements needed to bring that up because if you look at a project and you're like, oh, this is a forestry project, number one, I'd be shocked in the city of Tacoma. Um, number two, I'd be like, great, easy, exempt from the normal requirements. So off to the other world of looking at things. But good thing to know that there are projects that are just exempt from the minimum requirements. OK, so there's also things that are, um, sorry about that little blue thing at the top. Just noticed it. Oh, well. Um, things that seem like pavement maintenance, but actually aren't. So your road crews might be like, 
wait a minute, Mika, that's pavement maintenance. And I'm like, actually, per, per the permit, I'm sorry, it's not. Um, so removing and replacing an asphalt or concrete pavement to base course or lower, um, or repairing the pavement base is considered a replaced hard surface. So if you're going down to base course, you're in the world of minimum requirements. <coughs> Um, if you're just doing what we call a grind and overlay where you're not getting to that base course, you're exempt. You're part of that exempt list. But if you're getting down to that base course, that's where ecology has decided, hey, we need to start looking at minimum requirements. If you're extending the pavement aid, uh, the age, edge without increasing the size of the road prism or paving gravel, gravel shoulders, so making them paved, um, those are new hard surfaces. And then if you're doing any, any sort of upgrade, so dirt to gravel, dirt to a bituminous surface treatment, um, asphalt or concrete, upgrading from gravel to chip seal, asphalt or concrete, or chip seal to asphalt or concrete. Um, those are new impervious surfaces. So if you're upgrading surface types to make it a better surface type, it's a new hard surface. We'll get into what new hard surface means. Um, but those seem a lot like pavement maintenance, but for the purposes of minimum requirements, they are not. Um, okay, the project's not exempt. Um, now what? Okay, now we get into the world of definitions. Um, so is this project new development or is it redevelopment? Because the minimum requirements are different. Uh, depending on if it's new development or redevelopment. So redevelopment is, I'm going to go down to the second one, a uh, site that's already substantially developed, so has 35% or more of existing hard surface. Then it's a redevelopment project. So there was something already out there. We're doing something to it. We're redeveloping the site. Pretty much everything else is new development. So it's kind of a nice forested lot or it's pasture or something like that. And we're coming in and building a building on it. But if there was something already there, then it's a redevelopment site. These are the actual definitions from the permit. So at some point later, you can read them word for word. So that's the first thing we need to know. Second thing we need to know, what kind of project is this? Um, is it residential? Is it multifamily? Is it commercial? Is it a road-related project? What sort of project is it? Um, need to know that. That, will, that also defines what your minimum requirements will be for a project. Oh, great. We're on to our example question. This first one, you're going to need to look at this one. We are building a convenience store that has the coldest beer in all of your jurisdiction. Um, so think about it, look at it, and is this project new development or redevelopment? I think there's hints in the bullets that'll tell you, hopefully, that was my intent. And then also what sort of construction is it? Is it residential, multifamily, commercial, road related? Is it something else? Um, give you guys a few seconds to think about this one. Next, we're going to talk definitions. We're going to dive into the world of definitions. I feel like there's a lot of slides on this, but not entirely sure. We'll see. Um, so definitions are used for determining your minimum requirements. Um, note, they may vary by jurisdiction. What we have here is straight out of the permit, but as a permittee, um, you are allowed to have slightly different definitions as long as ecology tells you that they are equivalent to their manual. But these are straight out of the permit. So a project is any proposed action to alter or develop a site. So basically what is happening is the project. Um, the project site, note the difference there. We added an extra word. The portion of a property, properties, or right of way subject to the land disturbing activities new hard surfaces or replaced hard surfaces. So that's sort of, you know, if you, there's road work and on site, all that's your project site. Here's you know, visual. Um, then site 
is the area defined by the legal boundaries of a parcel or parcels of land that are subject to the new development or redevelopment. Um, for road projects, it's the length of the project site and the right-of-way boundaries defining the site. So these are three words that are going to be important for figuring out your minimum requirements. And they all sound very similar, don't they? Project, project site, and site, but they're all distinct in determining your requirements. And this is why a definition, like having them in front of you every time you look at a project is very important because it's very confusing. All right, this one has so, so many words on it. That's okay. I like lots of words on a slide. <laughs> um, hard surface is an impervious surface, a permeable pavement, or a vegetated roof. Also going to be real important when we're going through the flow charts to figure out what your minimum requirements are. Um, new impervious surface, a surface that's changed from pervious to impervious, or one of those upgrades that was in the pavement, the not pavement exemption zone. So those upgrades from gravel to asphalt or concrete, those are all new. And then impervious, I'm not going to read any of these, but it's basically anything like a roof, a walkway, a patio, anything hard where water cannot get into it or where water is slowed down because of it. It also includes packed earthen materials. That one's always kind of confusing, but that is an impervious surface, a packed down basically dirt is impervious. Um, yeah. but more important definitions, replaced hard surfaces. Um, for structures, so for buildings, the removal and replacement down to the foundation. Um, for other surfaces like parking lots, roads, it's going down to that base course or bare soil. So that's going to be the replacement. Um, converted vegetation areas comes up in the, when we get to vegetation converted to lawn landscape, um, where native vegetation, pasture, scrub shrub, unmaintained non-native are converted to lawn or landscape, or where that native is converted to pasture. And then kind of the last, I think the last big one when we're going through the flow charts, is native vegetation converted to pasture. So. Native vegetation is like native vegetation, like a forest. Basically what would have been here a long time ago. I think in Tacoma we have so little of it that it rarely comes up in plan review, but if you're one of the jurisdictions that still has nice pieces of property out there that are going to be developed, um, you might come into that world. More, actually more, all right, more important definitions. Uh, land disturbing activity. It's basically anything that's going to change that existing soil cover, including clearing, grading, filling, compacting. Why do we care about all these different? Okay, not quite to why we care about them. But what do we do when there aren't any definitions? So there's going to be places in the world where you're going through the flow chart. We're going to talk about these flow charts. So we're trying to figure out your minimum requirements where there isn't a definition in the permit or there isn't a definition in the stormwater management manual for Western Washington. Um, so what do you do? A lot of these things aren't defined. So it's up to you as a jurisdiction to interpret what they mean. Um, make sure you are consistent. Ask other jurisdictions how they interpret those words. Um, it's good to be consistent amongst jurisdictions. Um, develop your own because you have to, you know, there are things where you actually can't figure out what the minimum requirements are without those definitions. Um, develop interpretation documents and keep track of those documents. You might have internal ones and external ones, but there are going to be cases where there just is, aren't things defined by ecology. So as jurisdictions, we get to define them. Just make sure you track how you define them and why you define them and why you think it's okay to define them that way. Okay, quantifying the project. Uh, mineral requirements are based upon the square footage of impacts to the project. 
So that hard surface, replaced hard surface, land disturbing area, those are your impacts to a project site. And keep in mind, there's no such thing in the world of plan review. Well, maybe in the world of plan review, but in the uh, permit world of plan review, there is no net concept. So if someone's saying, but I'm replacing, I'm, there's this new thing, but over here I'm taking away this other thing, that's mm -hmm. not how it works. It's based upon hard surfaces, replaced surfaces, and land disturbing activities on a site. So there is no net concept. People always want there to be a net concept, but there just isn't when you're determining something. Interject. So this comes in a lot with schools. Here in Tacoma, we're replacing a lot of our schools. And so this comes in when we've got an existing school that they still need to use, and they decide to build a new school on the field, and then they tear down the old school and put a field back. And they're like, but it's equal, so we don't have anything new, right? Wrong. There's no net concept, and so basically they're in it for their new hard surfaces, and then when they tear down the old school, then it's like converting it from impervious to pervious. So all those associated um, requirements apply to the entire action. Even if in the end game, you know, they still have the same amount of impervious surface. Got it. Thank you. So this is the existing site that you guys have in front of you, the coldest beer convenience store. Um, you know, there's 19,000 square foot lot, 17,000 square feet of hard surface area, one of those definitions that we learned, that hard sur gravel is hard surface. Um, we're gonna say there's no lawn landscape, it's just a big old gravel lot uh, with a little bit of scrubby stuff that we're gonna call vegetation area, because it's vegetation. Um, and there's no native vegetation out there because we're in Tacoma. Um, we're going to be disturbing the entire thing because we're going to be basically what we do to a lot of lots here in an urban environment is we just kind of rip the whole thing out and put something in, right? So we're going to be actually disturbing the entire lot. That's pretty common in an urban area. We're going to be putting in 10,000 <coughs> square feet of new hard surface. So that new hard surface is going to include what, your roofs, your parking lot, your driveways, your drive aisles, your walking paths, all sorts of things like that. So that's, so the non-pollution generating is gonna be your walking paths, your roofs. Your pollution generating is gonna be your driving surfaces, your driveways, your parking lots, things like that. Um, there's no replaced hard surfaces because everything out there was gravel. So it's all getting an upgrade to some sort of pavement, um, to some, we'll, we'll call it asphalt, um, maybe some concrete. So it's all getting an upgrade from gravel to something. So there isn't any replaced. If there was a, you know, an existing old parking lot that we were tearing out, then that little section would be replaced. But it's not for this example. Um, there's gonna be some lawn landscaped, and it's a really expensive improvement. Minimum requirement thresholds. So for new development, so this is the sites that have less than 35% of existing hard surface. So this is where we're going to start getting into the world of what minimum requirements are and how they comply. So for new developments, you have to comply with minimum requirements 1 through 5 for the new and replaced hard surface and the land disturbed, so one through five for all those things, for every single surface that had, that is an impact. For projects that result in 2,000 square feet or greater of new plus replaced hard surface, or if they have land disturbing activity of 7,000 square feet or greater. So it's relatively small projects that you're having to look at for minimum requirement determination. It's pretty much every single family home in the city of Tacoma at least, is going to be looking at minimum requirements. Um, and you'll have to comply with the kind of harder requirements as we call them, minimum requirements one through nine, for the new and replaced hard surfaces and the converted vegetation areas if there's 5,000 square feet or greater of new plus replaced hard surface, or if you're doing any of these conversions, 
converting three quarters of an acre or more of vegetation to lawn or landscape, or two and a half acres or more of native vegetation to pasture. So also relatively low thresholds. Um, so that's why we do a lot of plan review. That's why hopefully there's lots of you that you get to do it in your jurisdiction because most projects have to look at the minimum requirements. Okay. Also for re okay, redevelopment, sorry. That was new development. On to redevelopment. So this is sites that are 35% or more of existing hard surface on the site are considered redevelopment and they have slightly different thresholds for figuring out the minimum requirements, which is a little annoying, but that's okay. Um, so similar though for new development, you have to comply with one through five for um, if you're 2,000 square feet or more or the 7,000 square feet of disturbed. And the same for one through nine for the, but notice what's different here is one through nine just for the new hard surfaces so new only if you result in 5,000 square feet or more, three quarters of an acre or more, or two and a half. But then you will maybe have to um, look at mitigating for those replaced surfaces if certain additional thresholds are met. So if, if it's total of new plus replace is 5,000 square feet or more and for commercial or industrial projects, if the value of the proposed improvements is 50% or more of the assessed, there's a typo there, assessed value of the existing project improvements, then you have to look at mitigating both the new and replaced hard surfaces. So evaluation piece comes into play for if you have to bring those replaced surfaces into the mitigation world. And notice project site improvements. Project site. We looked at that, that definition earlier. There was the project, the project site, and the site. So for commercial industrial, you look at the whole project site improvements to figure out your valuation. For all the other projects, so like your residential projects, or multifamily, I guess, you'd look at the valuation of the proposed improvements for just the site to see if you have to also look at mitigating for those replaced surfaces in addition to the new surfaces. Hence the importance of knowing all these definitions because they come into play in so many spots, right? Site, project site, new hard surface, replaced hard surface, converted vegetation areas, all of these are just figuring out which minimum requirements apply to a project. And it's very confusing. And this is new in the new permit, this new project site versus site. So we're all going to learn that together. OK, here are the minimum requirements. Here they are. There's nine of them. Minimum requirement number one is preparing a site plan. Minimum requirement number two is a construction stormwater pollution prevention plan. I'm going to go through each of these in detail later, too. But I'm just going to run through them. Now, mineral requirement number three, source control. Four, preservation of natural drainage systems. Five is on-site management. Six is runoff treatment. Seven is flow control. Eight is wetland protection. Nine is operation and maintenance. And these are the ones from the permit. Each jurisdiction will have something like this, but there might be additional mineral requirements that apply to a certain jurisdiction, but these are the ones from the permit. Okay, so before the break, we are going to figure out which minimum requirements we should review for our project. And to help do this, there are Ecology has created these handy little flowcharts. So you're going to either be looking at, and actually we figured out it was, it was redevelopment the other day. So there's this flowchart here that says flowchart for determining requirements for redevelopment. 